Well, hello there, and welcome to another edition of Warbird Wednesday. My name is Fred Bell. Today, we are headed down the Italian peninsula a little further, Greg. Greg, I have an airplane that you're not going to be able to refuse today, Greg. I have the Savoia Marchetti, the SM-79. I hope I didn't butcher that too much. But first, you have noticed the headgear that get Greg has quaffed me in. We are doing this one is just before Halloween. Again, I keep going ridiculous hats. A deal's a deal. This one is utterly ridiculous, Greg. And it is inflatable. So I guess I'm a, a witch today, a warlock. I would be a warlock if I were wearing this hat. So I'm going to go ahead and take off my warlock hat, toss it off frame. Good catch by the Kenny. And uh, we're doing a whole Halloween thing today. But the, the, uh, the SM-79 was an aircraft that was designed by Alessandro Marchetti. And it first flew in 1934. It was introduced in 1936. Uh, and it was retired in 1952. Now, this is unusual for Axis aircraft. But remember, the Italians, they understood which way the, uh, the war was going, and they made a deal, Greg. They made a deal, and they switched sides, uh, and they, uh, so they retired the aircraft in 1952. It soldiered on with the Lebanese Air Force until 1959, so it was around for quite some time. The air crews called it the Gabo Maledato, which means the damned hunchback if you can believe that in Italian. Um, there was a fairly low build rate, uh, build rate of 1,240. So we're seeing uh, in a lot of these aircraft, and I would call this, uh, this was a, a transport and a, um, uh, a, it had different roles. It was a torpedo bomber and a bomber. Um, it was, um, but I, I would say relatively a tactical aircraft Maximum speed was 290 miles an hour. Now we're going to talk about that. I'm going to go ahead and pick this up, and I'm going to give you a plan view of the airframe. Uh, Greg can go ahead and throw it up. Three engines. Now the interesting thing about this airplane, Greg, is that you would think that it was not very fast, or you know, it doesn't look fast in its design. But this aircraft. Um, between 1937 and 1939 established 26 separate world records. And at one time in the early 30s, this was the fastest passenger airplane in the world, if you can believe that. So it was um, uh, amazing. It carried on into, it was the fastest medium bomber in the world at that time. So. That is uh, pretty interesting. Now, what would it compare to? It would compare to one of the usual suspects in the Henkel, the 111. If you wanted to talk about the same type of airplanes, you could throw a Henkel up there. Uh, the Germans obviously had a number of twins. Uh, the Ju-88 would be uh, another example uh, of an aircraft that was somewhat comparable. The German aircraft, like the SM-79, were very, very fast. Now, the airplane uh, established itself in the Spanish Civil War. It was so fast that it did not fly with fighter escorts in the Spanish Civil War because it could out outrun the interceptors. So it relied primarily on its speed. Now, you'll notice, and Greg can, uh, can get maybe a better view of the airplane, but it did not have it actually started out, the armament started as a Lewis gun, if you can believe that. They had like a retractable mount with a Lewis gun. It did not have, because of its speed, uh, incredible defensive armament. Like the Germans called the B-17 the flying porcupine. This was not a flying porcupine. This airplane was designed to be fast. In the early versions of the airplane, it didn't have the hunchback. It was designed without the hunchback, but they actually added some interior space into the airframe to make it a more of a passenger airplane. So that's why they, why they did that. And so Spanish Civil War was its, its first uh, outing and it was very successful. Now, like the um, other German bombers, medium bombers of the day, and maybe you can, Greg can show a cutaway, 
but the bombs would actually be either loaded in either vertically, either up or down vertically, and they would fall out of the airplane that way. So it had a weird way, but all of the Axis Air, most of the Axis airplanes had that kind of bombing profile. It, you know how we think of bombs as they load into the B-17 and the B-25 and the other airplanes. A lot of the Axis airplanes didn't have that bombing profile, and Greg can throw those up, and there were, were different ones to do that. Um, later, it was modified where it was very, very lethal, and that it was, it was modified as a torpedo bomber. Now, you would not think that this aircraft would be a great torpedo bomber. Nay, say I, Greg. It actually heavily damaged the, US, the HMS Manchester uh, in the Mediterranean. It did a lot of fighting in the Mediterranean. And in one year as a torpedo bomber, it sank nine uh, Allied warships and damaged 30 others. The reason that it was so successful, we talked about uh, tactical American aircraft, carrier-borne aircraft, like the Devastator, one of the issues with this is it was so fast that it could come in on its run so quick and get away. The Devastator was relatively slow. I mean, you were a sitting duck out there. This airplane was really quick, so it would come in, make its run, and break away. It, uh, it was very successful. It fought in North Africa. It fought in Greece. It fought in Yugoslavia. Uh, so it, it had all kinds of combat time. The crews absolutely loved this aircraft. Now, another interesting fact about this is that the Italians experimented with this. If you remember the Mistel, and we've talked about that before, which was a German composite radio-controlled glide bombs where they would take like a Ju-88 and put a, a 109 or a, a, a 190, an FW-190 on top of it, the Italians actually experimented with this aircraft as a glide bomb, as a drone. Uh, they, they experimented with it a little bit. One of the outings, they actually lost control of it, and it kind of flew on until it flew into a mountain. But, uh, but they did experiment with it. Now, another thing that they did is they actually looked at putting a, an actual guided, radio-guided bomb out of the airplane, and that was called the Ambrosini, the Ambrosini, the AR-4. So they, they actually uh, experimented with that, um, and none of it ever came of anything, but they really were uh, cutting edge on this. At the Armstead, it, kind of, uh, it kind of moved off and, and continued to operate, and then at that point, the Italian initiative on military aviation was kind of lost, but uh, the airplane had, had quite a storied career. And it, again, if you think about it, would you have known that the aircraft um, set 26 separate world records in the mid-30s. I mean, it's just uh, one of those things that gets lost to history. I'm going to talk about how far this airplane got lost to history in a moment. But first, but first, I'm going to go to my uh, zombie-themed survival drink. This is a zombie survival can because Greg is worried about my brain. Obviously, he doesn't want my brains getting eaten. Um, I have looked at this. This has Interesting, the can be, can become used. You drink the drink, then you can fill the can with rocks. It has instructions. Fill the can with rocks and throw at a zombie. Uh, you could use it as a filter. Um, you can uh, dispose of it uh, responsibly. Uh, but it is, it's got all kinds of little zombie fighting tips here. So if you need that. Now, uh, it may turn you into a zombie. It is 110 milligrams of sodium in it. And uh, I told Greg, you're really looking out for here, here pal. It has, um, where was the, uh, the total sugar in this thing? It has 27 grams of sugar in it. So, Greg, after I drink this and I shoot through the roof of the hangar, uh, we will not be worried about zombies anymore. Now, what we're going to, oh, it has a, a disgusting uh, purple uh, uh, liquid in there, which is going to be very interesting in a moment. Today, I want to talk about the Great Britain. And Great Britain, the sun never sets on the British Empire, and the British naval fleet uh, during World War II uh, had a storied history back hundreds of years. Uh, and in the Mediterranean, they really considered the Mediterranean where they operated. The Italians and the British uh, went at it in the Mediterranean before we got into the war and even after that. 
and in uh, the Crete fighting and in Greece, uh, it, it was tooth and nail. So the one th what I want to do today is really salute all of the British maritime folks. If you're at home and you were involved in the British maritime actions, as I said, this aircraft uh, sank uh, nine British warships just on one year and damaged 30 other ships. So I want to uh, I want to salute all of the British maritime folks that fought in the Mediterranean. I salute you. And may I not turn into a zombie? Ooh. You know I hate to admit it, Greg. It's a little tart, uh, but it's it's I don't feel any zombification coming on. Mm. Customary second sip. I I actually. Greg, you're, you're, you're slipping. I actually, this one's not bad. It's got way, way too much sugar in it, which is probably why I like it. Mm. Go ahead and put that down. We'll turn the can forward. Um, so the aircraft itself uh, was, again, this was another groundbreaking airplane and an airplane that you probably have never heard of. Now, the notable pilots in it, were Carlo Emanuel Buscalaga. I hope I didn't destroy his name. He was the highest scoring SM-79 pilot. Now, interestingly enough, we talked about the uh, whole switching sides. He was killed while flying a, Bar a Martin Baltimore, if you can believe that. He was lost later in the war. Now, like all of these airplanes, a very low build rate, the aircraft does not survive in any numbers. There are two. Both of them, Greg, were going to Italy. Both of them are on the Italian peninsula. Now, the interesting thing is the Italians operated the airplane. They were donated to the Italian Air Force and they're in museums in Italy by the Lebanese, who were the last operators in 1959. The Italians didn't save any of them, apparently. There are bits and pieces of these airplanes scattered around, epinage, the fuselage, and I have seen some of these as they pop up in some of the forums that I'm involved in, but the only two surviving examples are in Italy. That's the only place you're going to see them. But it is a really interesting airplane. Now, if you want to have an SM-79 for your very own, you can do this. Jason in the gift shop has this image and it has a number of the airplanes that we've been talking about, number of aircraft in our collection, has a lot of really great renderings on Axis aircraft and there is the SM-79 so you can get that. Now we will send you one, unfortunately it will not be in a frame, it'll be rolled up. Now another place that you could see an SM-79 is I'm actually standing in front of our Axis identification wall in the Euro hangar and you can see we actually have one up there on the silhouette area. So you can actually come in when you're in the European Theater of Operations hangar. You can actually see uh, the silhouette of one of these aircraft. But if you want to see one in person, you have to go to Italy. Now remember, we cannot do any of this without your donations. So click on that donation link. Throw us a, a few lira, if you will. Throw us a few shekels. Uh, if you like this, and let's say you came across us on YouTube, give us a subscription and send this to a friend. We can, we certainly appreciate it. We are growing our subscriber base. We thank you for subscribing to the channel. We're going to kind of continue to try keep it interesting to museum airplanes. If you see us on Facebook, like us on Facebook, uh, share us, and we will see you again at Warbird Wednesday. My name is Fred Bell. Have a great day.